quick show of hands, please. And I only expect maybe a dozen hands to go up. How many of you were here when we did that? Leave your hand up, if you don't mind, just for a second. Right. One, those people probably are older, the, uh, at least older college students maybe. The, uh, but it just shows amazing what God has done and the growth that has happened and why, how it's necessary. If you're going to connect to something, if you're going to connect to our country, you have to take a citizenship test, which involves our history. If you're going to connect to this church, you need to understand some of our history. Not because it's so important, but because our past will propel us. And your past will always be present in your future. Not trying to blow, blow your minds out too early, but your past will always be present in your future, which is why what you do today in the present is so stinking important. Because what you do in the present will eventually be your past that will be in your future. So as we take a look at that and we think through that this morning, I want to say uh, thanks to those watching online. And uh, uh, instead of my normal black mug I got up here, the, uh, we have product placement this morning. As part of the homecoming, we're doing something special for those that this would actually interest you. These are handmade locally fired in a kiln coffee mug celebrating our 25th. Uh, they're available for sale at the Welcome Center. They're not a fundraiser by any means. Uh, we're barely covering expenses on them. But if it's something you're interested in, then they're about three colors, and there's about three different, ki uh, three different kinds and limited supply. So if it's something you're interested in, that's available. And one thing cool about our homecoming, we've got our first pastor coming back, Pastor Max and Patty Phipps. But uh, we've also got what I'd call our church's favorite son. You know, every, every organization's got kind of like a favorite son, someone that's been there for a long time but has moved away. He didn't move very far, but Brian McClure will be coming back and helping lead worship that day at our homecoming. Brian is now the full-time uh, worship pastor at Pitt Naz here in town. Uh, Brian started here in sixth grade, really learned a lot of his chops, especially on guitar. And I actually posted a video on our Facebook thing about a month ago, one of, one of Brian's first Sundays playing guitar with Pastor Chris Baker. This is like over 10 years ago. And let's just say Brian knew how to play loud at the time. <laughs> he could play loud really good, and now it's just so neat to see what God has done. So in this series, we're simply asking and challenging you, would you open the door for a blind person? Would you open the door for a blind person? And uh, last week, if you were in third service, you remember Alyssa was sitting right down here where Derek is. Derek does not look like Alyssa at all. The, uh, but Alyssa chuckled immediately. <laughs> and, then I, and then it hit me. Alyssa's uh, extremely uh, sight impaired. That's why, that's why uh, Heather's always walking and holding her hand. And Alyssa thought it was hysterical. And I said, would you open the door for a blind person? She just started laughing. She thought it was hysterical. We got Pauline who comes to first service and Pauline can't see. What would you do if you saw Pauline trying to find the door? You wouldn't Facebook it. You wouldn't take a photo. You would do what any normal, decent human being would do. You would say, hey, let me, let me get that for you. And you'd walk up, and you'd get the door for him, and you'd open the door. Well, the Scripture says really plainly, oh, I thought I had forwarded this. Pardon me. The Scripture communicates to us, Paul says, hey, the God of this world, meaning Satan, lowercase g, has blinded the minds of people that don't understand the gospel, that aren't following the gospel, that haven't had Christ come into their life. They're still walking in darkness it's really hard to find where you're going when you're walking in darkness. Usually all you can find is when you're walking in darkness is the corner of furniture, especially if you're walking barefoot at night. That and Legos. You can find Legos. That's what they're created for by God, I believe. But we are on the cusp of something amazing, I think, at our church. And it's going to take all of us and each of us, which is why we're taking some time for this series called Shape. Taking a look at your spiritual gifts, your heart, your abilities, your personality, your experience. The, uh, I heard this this past week when I was running, and I thought it was powerful. It's really hard... Well, it's just about impossible, and this might explain why some people mistreat you. So hang with me on this. this. I haven't shared this in any of the other services. When people mistreat you, they have a hard time seeing the image of God in you. It's probably because they don't see the image of God in themselves. When you get a good grasp on who God has made you to be, and you see his image in you, intellect, emotion, will, body, soul, spirit, when you see that in you, it's a whole lot easier to treat somebody else with the respect they deserve because they're made in the image of God. And so as we get there and as we move forward on that, when you understand yourself, this isn't just self-examination about how awesome we are. This is we're made in the image of God. And when we can understand how we're made and how he's made us, it reduces our stress when we quit comparing ourselves to each other. It increases success because the more we know ourselves, the more we know like, yeah, that might be okay and not sin, but I know myself, I'd go overboard on that. So no, I don't want the bag, extra bag of potato chips, thank you. No, I don't want the uh, unlimited refills on that, whatever that might be. And we're building this series on two ridiculously simple truths. You matter to God. Have you sinned really bad? You still matter to God. Have you done awesome in your religion experience? You still matter to God. Have you been a hyper-judgmental, critical Christian jerk? You still matter to God. 
You do. And you were shaped for a purpose. Every one of us. It does not matter what we've done or how bad we've done it. We've been shaped for a purpose. And so last week we talked about we should discover our gifts and, and then use them. And if you're here today and maybe you got drug here today and you're a skeptic or a cynic or you're stuck watching online you don't really want to be, uh, the stuff we're going to talk about today, I hope it resonates with you, but you don't have to do any of it. If you're not a follower of Christ, you don't have to do it. But the Christians that are listening are supposed to be doing what we're talking about. So if you have Christians in your life and you're a skeptic or a cynic, you can even point them out. Hey, man, you're supposed to be loving one another. What are, what are you doing that for? We need to be challenged by his word. So if you're following along with your notes this morning, and yes, we have fill in the blanks again. I had some people tell me, I'm so glad the fill in the blanks are back. Understanding your heart. Let's talk about the H. Now, there's another word we could use instead of heart. Some of the older Bible translations use a different word. And back, when you go back to the original languages, they use a different word than heart. They use the word bowels. Yes, bowels, like bowel. No, you don't have to finish that. That's all right. Because it comes from the inside and the depth. All those in favor of using the word heart today instead of bowels said aye. 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 All opposed are probably third grade boys. <laughs> probably third grade boys. But the idea of the bundle of motivations that's deep, deep down inside of us, your desires, hopes, longings, dreams, ambitions, affections. And for those of you 50 and older, and I just hit 52 this week, my heart's concerned about different things at 52 than it was at 22. For those of you who just hit 22, your heart is different, concerned about different things at 22 than it was at 12. For those of you at 15, your heart is concerned about something else than it was when it was at 8. Your heart continually morphs. But as it does that, all the more important to keep it in God's hands. Three things the Bible says about your heart. Number one, your heart explains why you say what you say. Your heart explains why you say the things you do. Jesus, in Matthew 1, 2, 3, 4. 1234. Out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. Man, why'd I say that? It was in your heart. That's why you said it. Yeah, but I don't like what I said. Maybe you don't like what's in your heart. And that's all of us at some time in our life. All of us. We have things in our heart that don't need to be there, but they're there. So we come, we come clean with that and we confess that to Jesus. Because Jesus is not a Boy Scout helping us to live gooder lives. He's a Savior rescuing us from a desperate, sick place. And that's what our heart does sometimes. Our heart determines three things according to the Scripture. Why I say the things I do, why I feel the way I do. Man, why do I feel that way? God's Word says that he, the Word of God judges the thoughts and attitudes of our heart. Our heart has thoughts and attitudes. It's why I feel the way I do. The last one is act. Why do I act the way I do? Well, above all else, guard your heart. Don't follow it. We'll talk about that in a moment, but don't follow your heart. Yo, Jason, good to see you, man. I haven't seen you in a while. Don't follow your heart. Guard it. Guard it. Why? Because it's the wellspring of life. What comes out of you? Why, why did I do that? It was in your heart. So let's get a quick show of hands here. How many of you have ever felt like punching somebody in the face? Who does not have their hand up? Don't trust them. <laughs> Unless they're going, I'd rather kick them in a private spot. Then avoid them. Now, why did you at some point in your life feel like punching somebody in the face? It's in your heart. <laughs> not me. I'm just nice. I'm sweet. I'm... No, you felt like punching somebody in the face. That's human. That's normal. Now, did you punch somebody in the face? Depends if you had a, you had a boxing ring and it was allowed or playing hockey, I guess. But when you're tempted to sin and you don't, that's a win. That's not a loss. That's a win. You don't have to beat yourself up because you wanted to punch someone in the face. You don't have to beat yourself up because you wanted to run them off the road on Ralph Street or a parking spot and they beat you to a parking spot on campus. The question is, what did you do? Not just how did you feel. Because we can't trust our heart. Your heart wanted to punch people in the face. Mine too. Because we can't trust our heart, all the more reason we need to commit all of my heart, all of our heart, all of our life, using those words interchangeably there, because that's what the Scripture's referring to, all of those motivations to Christ. God gave you your heart. He's got, he gave it to you with all those interests and desires and dreams and passions and ambitions, and without him, all those desires, dreams, passions, and ambitions are going to be misused, perverted, and wasted. You have all seen people follow their heart and end up at a dead end, bridge out, road. The heart is hopelessly dark and deceitful. 
It's a puzzle no one can figure out. Well, not me. I only want good things. No, you don't. You want to punch somebody in the face. We can't trust our heart. So what do we do if we don't trust our heart? Because you'll have people tell you, man, I just want to follow my heart, man. I'm just going to follow my heart because uh, that, that's just real. I'm just real, man. I'm real. I'm going to follow my heart. I'm authentic. I'm not fake and phony. What do you call someone that only follows their heart and has no filter on their actions and has no filter on their words and they only do what they want, when they want, how they want? Don't you call that person selfish? Rude? Unemployed? <laughs> Perhaps jailed? <laughs> Or a two-year-old brat. We have to put a filter on it. What's that filter? Commit it to Christ. Commit the entire thing to Christ. Don't trust your heart. Lead it. Oh, lead it. Tell it where you want it to go. Give it to God and let him pour into it what he wants to pour into it. Delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Two ways to look at that. The way that would not line up with Scripture is, what that means is Mark Lehman should drive north to Kansas City to the Mini Cooper dealership and find the favorite Mini Cooper that he wants, run around it seven times, praying in the name of Jesus, and expecting that God's going to give me the desires of my heart, God, God, I delight of myself in the Lord. Or, I commit my entire way to him. Everything in my life, not just my heart. But my pocketbook, my relationships, my attitude, my dreams, my goals, I commit my way to the Lord. I trust in him. And he starts dropping the desires into my heart that he wants to be there. Now I get to chase what my heart wants because he's changed my heart. I never wanted ever in my life to get up in front of people and talk. For those of you that don't know my story, I took Latin in college because it's not a spoken language. So I'd never have to get up and give a speech, you know, in Spanish or French. I took Latin instead. Where did that desire come from? He gave it. He gave it. When I, when I got saved back in 1985, quick show of hands, how many were not born in, by 1985? You were born after 1985. We're so glad you're here. We love millennials, man. We're glad you're here. The, uh, some of you are going, I'm not a millennial. It's not an insult. Hang in there. <laughs> but when I got saved in 85, about a year and a half later, there was an opportunity to participate in the church orchestra, which was nothing but a piano and an organ and a couple of guitars. And uh, I loved worship. And it wasn't because I was musical before I got saved. I wasn't. I got saved right after I got out of high school. And it wasn't because I enjoyed singing. I, I didn't, and I can't sing. Even then, when we were singing and, and Zeke was taking us through that reprise, I had my microphone off most of the time because I can't sing. I'm just way off pitch, and I know it. Um, but, I ha but I got to church, and we're singing these songs, I mean, ridiculously old hymns. And I love old hymns now. But I didn't even know them. But I loved worship. My heart was into it. Oh, it was into it. And so there was an opportunity to, to be part of it instead of just sitting back and singing. I can actually be up there. Well, I grabbed the guitar, the guitar that I bought after Bono asked me, do you play guitar at a concert? I didn't. I didn't. A few moments later, there was another guy on the platform playing guitar, knocking on heaven's door, G, D, A minor, C. I know it now. That's why I bought the guitar I have. And um, so I took my guitar and joined the church orchestra. Three guitars, I was easily the worst guitar, no doubt, no doubt. And then I had to wear a tie. This church was piano, organ, and robed choir. I had to wear a tie. I owned one tie. I have a picture of me wearing it. I couldn't find it. I was going to show it to you this morning. This one tie I wore to a homecoming dance one time in high school. We took it across the street to the only guy we knew that could tie a tie. He tied it for us. When the homecoming dance was over, I loosened it up lifted it off, and it's still tied on that hanger <laughs> if it's around anywhere. But I had to wear a tie because that was the requirement. But my heart was into worship, so I went down to J.C. Penney and I bought two shirts, one with vertical green stripes, one with vertical red stripes. I found two ties that I thought had red and green in them. I turned around and showed them to an old lady. I was 20. Everybody was old. Showed them to an old lady. And I go, do these match? She goes, oh, those look really good, young man. I go, thank you. That's what I wore for the next six or seven months. And if you understand music and you understand guitar, you know how awkward it is to try and learn how to play in three flats, four flats, and five flats. It's all right. That most of the old hymns are written like that. And then you also understand what it's like to play in three, four, and four, four, but then you know what like six, eight, and six, nine time is. Blessed assurance. Blessed assurance. You know how hard that is to play right hand with the monk. I had no idea what I was doing. 
But my heart, my heart was there. My heart was there. The photos we showed you earlier of people who had a heart for his house that were part of the Green Thumb team and spent three or four hours yesterday morning investing their time. The, the people that helped paint a kid's room. They pop, most of all of them don't have any kids in this church. They painted it for your kids. Why? Because they led their heart. I led my heart, even though I didn't want to wear a tie. I led my heart, even though I didn't want to learn how to play in five flats. I led my heart. Don't trust it. Lead it. Moving past heart, let's get to the A. Let's talk about abilities. Abilities. While I take a drink from my sponsored 25 anniversary cup, on sale in the foyer, the, uh, about your abilities. Every ability is given by God. Every ability. We talked last week about spiritual gifts. Those are given by God. This week we're talking about natural abilities. Those are given by God. Which one's more important? It doesn't matter if you don't give them to God. If you don't use your spiritual gifts for God, it doesn't really matter if they're important. If you don't use your natural abilities for God, it doesn't matter if they're important. And God said he gave different abilities. Look at the, the scripture. There are different kinds of spiritual gifts but the same spirit. There are different ways of serving with the same Lord. There are different abilities to perform service. Would you read the last part of this verse out loud with me? We're starting at the word but. Are you ready? One, two, three. But God gives ability. Oh, your rhythm's getting there. Let's try it one more time. Ready? One, two, three. But God gives. Yeah, you still don't have rhythm. That's all right. <laughs> I know what the word ability means. I got I to gotta grasp on that. What do you think everyone means? You think maybe in the original languages in the Greek it means everybody but you? <laughs> everybody that wants to? There's not a single person that's been on this property all day that doesn't have the ability to serve. Now, there's some that don't have the willingness, and there's some areas of service their life does not allow right now. But there's no one that's been on this property today, including the people that really literally cannot see, that's unable to serve. There's no one, regardless of their intellectual capacity, that's incapable of serving in some way. Or their physical capacity, because some people are coming in on wheelchairs and canes. It doesn't stop them from serving. They have the ability to serve. You have the ability to serve. If you compare your ability to somebody else, you're belittling what God has given you. Don't do that. Don't do that. The Bible lists many abilities that God gives. Not an exhaustive list by any means. But these are all actually in the scripture. Abilities that God gives. And any ability that God gives can be misused or it can be used for his glory. Glory is a fancy Bible word for his honor, his respect, his purposes. If God gives it, it can be used. You can repair a car to the glory of God. I cannot because I cannot repair a car. I cannot repair a car to the glory of anything. But you, maybe you can repair a car to the glory of God. You can balance financial books. I can do that for the glory of God. You can bounce a basketball for the glory of God. You can sack a quarterback, Levi. And please do that more often this year. For the glory of God. You can manage an office. You can make a meal. You can make a sale. You can make money. You can paint a wall. You can plant a bush for the glory of God. You can also do it for your own glory. You can. Because your abilities kind of show God's plan for your life. If you are seven foot two and 300 pounds, God has probably not set you up to be a, a jockey riding horses. Probably not going to happen. If you are four foot nine, you're probably not going to be in the NBA. But some of your abilities will show God's plan for your life. Why did he give you those abilities? To bring glory to him. Why did he give you those abilities? To serve one another. Why did he give you those abilities? Perhaps it's also a way to earn income for your family. No reason not whatsoever it can't be also for income. What you're able to do is what God wants you to do. He didn't randomly say, oh, here comes Layman, let's throw down a bunch of abilities. Good luck with that. No, he purposely gave you the abilities he wanted to. And why would he give them to you for them just to be wasted? But can I tell you that you won't discover what he has placed in you until you offer it? And I never had this thought hit me. I've been following Jesus since 85. That's when TV came out. There wasn't color TV yet. It was just black and white then, but... I've been following Jesus since 85, and I never had this thought hit me until I was praying over here this morning. I can assure you, by the authority vested in me as a human being, that the guitar that I played in 1986-87 at that church service, the music that came out of that in no way encouraged anyone to worship God anymore. <laughs> 
It did not fill the place with the awesome presence of God, and people went, oh, that music, I need to worship God. Nothing. It did, it did not impact and raise the level of anything in that room, but it impacted and raised me. Totally. And it hit me this morning. What if I had never said, sure, I'll play? Because I could look at Jerry Bott and say, man, Jerry can play a whole lot better than me, and he could. Or I looked at Rick Speaker and say, man, Rick, Rick Speaker, he can blow Jerry Bott out of the water. What am I doing up there? Offering what I have. That's all I'm doing. And what I had wasn't much. And it definitely wasn't much compared. But would I have even stayed connected to a church if I hadn't started serving? Some of you, this is like the eighth church you've, you've attended in the past eight years. Because you've never connected in serving. You just attend. Then when it gets complicated or difficult or the pastor teaches something out of God's word you don't like, you're gone. And you wonder why your Christian life stinks. Because you're not in the tenth, you're not on the tenth mile of your marathon. You're still running mile one for the tenth time. And you're going, when does this thing end? It doesn't. You're on worse than a merry-go-round. Your merry-go-round's going backwards. That's all I brought. But that's all he asked me to bring. And when I brought that to him, when I brought playing third guitar to him, that wasn't even plugged in. They did let me have strings. Usually I could play with strings. Then all of a sudden it was brought to me, hey, Mark, would you like to be the church custodian? Apparently I was found faithful, so became the church custodian. And then God apparently saw me faithful with that and said, hey, would you like to receive the call of God on your life? And I said, God, I want to do whatever. And then it just kept coming and coming. We don't know what God wants to do with you. But I know if you'll offer it to him, something will happen. The last point we'll end on is this. If I don't use my abilities, I'll lose them. I'm going to walk you through a parable of Jesus. These are Jesus' words, his true words. What he's sharing, though, is a story. It's not a real story. But the story he's sharing tells real truth. God has given you blessings. He's given you abilities. I see it in Matthew 25. It'll be like a man going on a journey who called his servants and entrusted his property to them. He's given you something. He's entrusted to you abilities. Yes, someone may have more abilities than you, and someone may have less, which is actually the next verse. To one, he gave five talents of money. Jesus told this story from what we can tell in the scriptures multiple times in a little bit different ways. Sometimes it was a bag of gold, according to some translations. It was talents of money. Sometimes it was an amount of money. And the idea was he gave one person five. He gave another one two. Wait a second. That's more than twice what the first person got. Then he gave the other person one talent of money. One that's 20% of what the first person got, each according to his, please say it out loud with me, each according to his ability. How rude. Hey, you got a lot of ability. Five for you. Hey, you, got, you barely have half the ability of them. Two for you. Sorry, I won't even look that way. You've only got one ability, one for you. How rude. How accurate. How many of you were listening to the worship music when Andy was on drums earlier? Did you, hear, did you hear Andy on the drums? How many of you can play as good as Andy? His wife. Yeah, anybody else? You can play as good as Andy, Jimmy? All right, we'll let you play later after everyone's gone. <laughs> he has more talent than you on drums. He does. That's probably never going to change. What if we played basketball? John, you're on my team. Yeah, yeah. Why? He's got more basketball talent than you do. What if we're going to fix cars? Who can fix cars in the house? Point at somebody. <laughs> yeah, Nathan's on my team. Yeah, right there, right there. Yeah, you can fix cars? That's awesome. Way to go. You're not even 10 yet. You can fix cars. I'm impressed. Someone's always going to have more talent than you. And God gave it to him. He did. And someone might have less than you. Don't compare. There's nothing to gain in comparison. When we look at that, as Americans, we would say, that's not yeah, it's not fair. Let's be accurate with God's word. Let's be open and honest. It's not fair. It's not. He gave one person five, one person two, one person one. That's not fair. Too bad. God's not fair. 
Read the entire thing if you want, all the way from Genesis all the way to Revelation. He never claimed to be fair. He's merciful. That's better than fair. He's just. That's better than fair. He's loving. That's better than fair. You can find someone who's fair, who is a jerk, a moron, and rude, and doesn't even care about you, but they're fair. He is better than fair. Let's keep going. Sorry I'm keeping you too long. People respond differently to what God gave them. The man who had five talents went at once and put his money to work and gained five more. Cha-ching! So also the one with two talents gained two more. Cha-ching! But the man who had received the one talent went off and dug a hole and hid his master's money. Some of you have talent. You're doing something with it. There's someone else in the room who has the exact same talent and they're hiding it. Hide it under a bushel. No. Let it shine. But what if my talent isn't as good? I get it. I get it. My talent wasn't as good. I get it. The man with two talents. Oops. Woo, 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 woo. Turn back. Why did that sound like the three stooges? Man. The, uh, and so the man that had two talents. I lost my spot totally. Sorry. Gained two more. Um, yeah, Bob lost my spot. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but the man who received the one talent went out. There we go. Okay, okay. The, um, we're all going to be accountable. After a long time, the master of those servants returned and settled accounts. We're going to give an account. If you have five talents and I have two, I won't give an account for having five. I'm only going to give an account for having two. If I have two and you have one, you only give an account for one. You don't have to worry about my two. And we're all going to be compensated for how we develop what God gave us. Compensated, rewarded. The man who received five talents brought the other five. Master, you entrusted me with five talents. I've gained five more. His master replied, well done. Good job. You've been faithful with a few things. Here's some more. Here's some more. The man with two talents also came. Master, you entrusted me with two talents. I've gained two more. Well done. Good job. You've been faithful with a few things. Here's some more. Here's some more. Awesome. What about the other guy? Then the man who had received the one talent of, talent of money came. Master, I knew that you are a hard man, a harvesting where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. Note to self, do not insult someone who gives you money. Bad move. Bad move. The, uh, so I was afraid. Note to self, too. Fear is not from God. He's not giving you a spirit of fear. And if you're walking in fear, come down to the front for prayer. If you're walking in fear... Draw to the light. If you're walking in fear, worship your guts out today and get out of the darkness and get into the light. So I was afraid, and I went out, and I hid your talent in the ground. See, here's what belongs to you. And the master replied, good job, way to go. No, you wicked. Wicked, wow. That's harsh. I didn't even see a Ouija board in the guy's house. He's calling him wicked. I didn't even see a pentagram. He's calling him wicked. You wicked, lazy Servant. And if you read the rest of Matthew 25, it gets worse for that guy. Some quick and simple observations. Whatever God gave you, he wants more back. And he's made it so you can give him more back. If you'll just place what he has given you in his hands, however small you think your talent or your ability is, if you put it in his hands, he'll add to it. He will. If you take $1,000 and take it down to the bank, go back in a year and get all your money, you only have $1,000 and no interest, you use the wrong bank. You should get it back with interest. What God has given you, he's expecting it back and more. Two people looked at what God gave them as a blessing. Wow, look what God gave me. What a blessing. One person looked at it as a burden. Two of them were called good and faithful, and they got more. They were compensated. They were rewarded. This church has been compensated and rewarded by God nearly every step of the way. One person was called unwise. No, they weren't called unwise, were they? They were called wicked and lazy, and they lost what they had, and it was taken from him. Use what God has given you. God places people and abilities in the local church. This is a local church. He has put people and abilities in this church so that we can do what he wants us to do. And as we have worked with what we've had, whether we want to go back to uh, uh, 1998, 1999, 2000, when we were meeting in a place, a rented place on North Highway 69, when we look back and we worked with whatever we had, God blessed. And he gave us some more. Not because of what we prayed, not because of what we confessed with our words, but because of what we did with what he put in our hands. 
And then we had one building, and we had one service, and two services, and then continued. Whatever we have in our hands, that's what we're going to do with. When we have a water outreach now, we have these really nice bottles of water we can give out that have printed full-color labels on them, and it looks pretty thinking impressive, honestly. But that's because we started by me filling up these uh, five-gallon jugs down at Walmart for 33 cents a gallon. You, know, you walk in, they got that water thing you fill up. Like 33, that's how I filled them all up to start with. And we just had these eight-ounce styrofoam cups. That's all we could afford. And I had a $30 inkjet printer, and I printed a label on the side, Family Life Assembly of God Church, currently a tiny church. That's all we had. We'll do everything we can with all we have. Will you do everything you can with all you have, or will you be the person that says, when I get more, I'll go ahead and start giving? When I get more finances, when I get more talent, when I get, well, then I'll start giving. Put it in his hands, friends. Put it in his hands and watch and see what he can do. Why should God send more people to us if we're not prepared to serve him? Why should God send more kids to us? Kids. Pastor Anthony on a sabbatical visited life.church, uh, one of the churches he visited. And if you had the Bible app on your phone, they're the ones that made it. And what he noticed and what really stood out to me was what he, when he mentioned in their nursery and in their kids' areas, there were more men serving than women. We are absolutely upside down on that. And so next Sunday, we want to give you a chance. So I'm giving you a heads up. So because it's required of us that we be found faithful. And I want to give you a chance to have that opportunity to use your spiritual gifts, your heart, and your abilities. So especially men, if you want to look for a Sunday to skip next week because you don't want to, want to be here, I'm giving you a heads up what we're going to do. We have growth track, and we want you to get connected to growth track and, and, and step into serving. But sometimes we have to fast track. In the area of kids, 12 and under, kids and nursery, we're short on, 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 team, on team volunteers. That's not uncommon. That's every church in America. <laughs> so we're going to set up something safe and secure, dead, simple, stupid next Sunday. If you're willing to go, I'd give that a shot for 70 minutes a month for three months. I'm going to give you a chance. Give you that opportunity. See if that is something that will ignite something in you. If you were to take a drone in 1985 and fly it inside the church building where I was meeting, one, well, you would have been arrested. <laughs> but and take it up to the top and you would have gotten a photo and you would have looked at the entire church in 1985 that I was a part of and were to pick out the person who was most likely to become a pastor. You would have picked all my friends right around me. Who knew their Bible better? Who sang a whole lot better? <laughs> who dressed a whole lot better? <laughs> Who could actually find the Old Testament from the New Testament? You wouldn't have picked me. So if we pulled a drone out today, oh, wouldn't it be cool if I had one ready right now? But I just had the illustration idea. If we picked the drone up right now, flew it up, and put it above that screen and shot it back this way and took a picture and asked you to circle the person that God's going to use the most, you have no idea who it is. I can tell you one thing I know about that person, though. They're taking whatever they have and letting God use it, no matter how small it seems in comparison to what somebody else has. Stand with me, would you? And thanks for being so patient this morning.